Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ancient Wisdom for Modern Seekers. It's Sunday morning, and we're really pleased to have Swami Maha Yogananda back with us from the Vedanta Society of Southern California, the Hollywood Temple, which is still very limited in our uh, attendance because of the current situation. Um, but luckily, because of the magic of Zoom, we can all meet with Swami Mahi Yogananda here online. And today our topic is one, of, one that's very dear to my heart, um, Holy Mother, Sri Sharda Devi, there's her picture. And here's another picture of her. And she is just wonderful. I guess she's kind of known as a um, Hindu saint, but Swami Mahayogananda will give us some background on to how she got to be Holy Mother. So welcome, Swamiji. Thank you. It's a very sacred topic we have taken up. Last month, we talked about Sri Ramakrishna, and you asked if we could talk about Holy Mother this time. You suggested that's a, a great idea. And of course, when you th think who is Holy Mother, well, the first thing people say, well, she was Sri Ramakrishna's wife. But uh, it wasn't, she wasn't an ordinary, it wasn't an ordinary marriage. And they were neither of them ordinary people. And the first thing that we should mention is that uh, they were, it was not consummated on the physical plane as most marriages are. It was an entirely spiritual marriage and they both they were so they were both householders and monastics at the same time and uh, Sri Ramakrishna and the Holy Mother lived as a monk and nun for their whole lives so that's uh, an unusual uh, thing right off the bat right uh, and uh, the way that uh, Holy Mother manifested the divine motherhood through her life and her teachings that's what maybe we'll touch on I'm not yeah. sure where, where you'd like to begin yeah, let's start with, um, you know, I think we're kind of through the books and everything, we're introduced to her as a little child, because when she actually like married Sri Ramakrishna, she was very, very young. Mm -hmm. So um, go through the story of how that match was made. <laughs> well, Sri Ram, you know, Sri Ramakrishna was immersed in intense spiritual disciplines in Dakshineshwar outside Calcutta at the Kali temple complex there. And he actually became mad, mad for God. As he would say, people are, some people are mad for money. Some people are mad for enjoyment. Some people are mad for power. If you have to be mad, I'm mad for God. Be mad for God. So he actually became mad for God. And his family thought if he could be uh, married, he might be a little bit that might make him more normal that he would uh, again feel like he had worldly responsibilities it would bring his mind down to the, this plane and so they started looking for and and they they started looking for a wife and uh, then they, they weren't finding anything and gradually Sri Ramakrishna came to know and to their surprise he didn't um, object so he said, oh, all right, go ahead. But they couldn't find anyone. And finally he said, you're searching here and there, but the girl has already been earmarked, earmarked for me uh, in the village of Jairambati. Go to the home of the Mukherjees and you'll find her there. Marked with a straw it was the language he used. That's a very interesting language because the farmers of that locality, if they had, a say, a mango tree and there was one particularly good mango growing on it, they'd tie a straw around it what does that mean? Don't eat this one. This one is meant for God. We're going to offer this one when it gets fully big and fully ripe, we'll offer it to God. So he said, there's a girl marked with straw. She is already marked for God. It's beautiful. Yeah, I, I remember hearing that when they were looking for a wife, you know, Ramakrishna had such a reputation of being like the crazy man in town that women were like, I don't think so. No, no. Right, you know, right, most right. of them were saying no. And oh, yeah. well, um, they were even the parents. He was uh, uh, about 20, 21. Uh, mm -hmm. And th they were looking for a girl. Generally, the, f the husband was a bit older than the wife. And in this case, it happened to be a lot older. 
And of course, it was just a bit, even in ordinary marriages, that would be a betrothal. It wouldn't be, uh, you right. know. Right. But that, of course, that practice of child marriage has pretty much died out, though it may linger on in certain remote places, unfortunately, but it's yeah. not legal anymore. So, so she was just like five or something, right? It was five. Mm -hmm. And so she was just like reserved. She didn't even go live with him. She was just like, but they had, a, a they, had a they, they had a wedding. There was a wedding. Uh, at that age and she stayed for a few days and then she came several times to mm -hmm. live with her uh, Sri Ramakrishna's family and she, he started to train her and teach her and she would say when she was in Sri Ramakrishna's presence staying with him that her heart was full like a picture of like a picture of bliss placed in her heart she mm -hmm. was always uh, uh, utterly fulfilled uh, staying with Sri Ramakrishna and how much care he took teaching even he even taught her little things like how to trim the wicks on the lamp so he, he taught her a lot of things we think of Sri Ramakrishna as an impractical person perhaps but actually he, he knew how to do things like trim the wick on a lamp and gave her a lot of instructions that's beautiful all, all so through. then when when did she actually like move in and become the you know the lady of the house kind of thing well, there was no there was no house, and she wasn't the lady of the house. But uh, when she was eighteen, you know, the villagers can be the village gossip can be quite painful. And he had this reputation of being the madman, and people would gossip, "Oh, poor Sarada, she's married to that madman, and how how sad she couldn't get a real husband, and this kind of thing." It was really hurting her, and yet it didn't jive with the knowledge that she had of him because every time they were together he seemed perfectly loving and caring about her and uh yes talking a lot about god but not crazy actually very very sane so she finally just felt that she had to go see him and be with him and if she needed to serve to serve him but how to go she is too shy to mention it to her father Finally, it, there was a group of pilgrims going to Ganga Sagar, which is the, where the, the river Ganga, the holy river Ganga, enters the ocean. And that's uh, south of Calcutta. So she ex told her father she wants to go join that party to go to Ganga Sagar. But dad was smart. He understood, oh, she wants to go, she wants to, go to Sri Ramakrishna. So he agreed to take her and they went to Dakshineshwar fascinating incident happened on the walk. There were no trains back then between, the, no roads even. A lot of it was just paths, just dirt paths or rough wooden tracks with yeah. uh, bullock carts. Or if you didn't have money for that, just on foot. So they were going on foot. And that it was, was a long, long walk. Way, huh? And uh, it, it was a little much for Holy Mother. And she, she started, she, she felt ill. She caught fever on the way. And so the rest of the, they left, the rest of the party left and dad and daughter stayed behind. And she was uh, at least one day in, in terrible fever. And then wondering, I, I was, she, I, I was going to go see him, but, but now this has happened. Am I going to go see him? And so late at night, uh, she's feverish and half sleeping. And suddenly she finds a, a beautiful young woman completely black in complexion coming by her and stroking her body and the feeling of what a cooling uh, relief she felt with her the touch of this woman and uh, she she told her you see I wa wanted to go there to serve him but it looks like I, I can't and she said oh oh no yes you are you all go there uh, I, I have come there I have come from there and uh, oh is it who are you I am your sister so oh. we know that the, the Dakshineshwar Kali temple, the, the image of the Divine Mother is of the beautiful female figure, black in complexion. So this kind of mystic experiences, she doesn't know all the things that are going to unfold. Uh, well, she doesn't yet know who she is, uh, but these are little hints. Yeah, and that complete faith that she had, you know, that's very brave for an 18 year old to just go all that way to be with some person she hardly knows. Um, but it sounds like her family was supportive. Her parents were supportive. 
of all this, but that her family had its own issues and things going on too that were challenges for her. Later, yeah, her mom was fully supportive and her, her dad, but the brothers were a real trouble. Her brothers were like thorns in her side, almost. Oh, boy. <laughs> they they, they were entirely unspiritual. They had no interest in spirituality. They were um, interested in money and getting more property and being properly honored and all the things that most people in this world are interested in. So, uh, the, it's interesting because when I read those stories, it's like you can relate to everybody's own family. You know, you got the crazy brother and the uncle and the this and that going on and the niece and right. aunts. And, and, and we, 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 right, we, uh, that's one thing about the Holy Mother that she lived a life in the world, but not of the world. But she was, yet she was there amidst her brothers and then, right, her niece and her nieces and other family members and then she had also this sort of family of monks around her and there was a, a lot of conflict and a lot of uh, craziness shall we say yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, she and just... yet she and yet she was was like uh, sailed through it with her with her infinite patience and compassion and forgiveness yeah a lot of grace there so she arrived in it, Sri Ramakrishna and like you say, they really didn't have a house. They were kind of like going place to place for a while. So she, they didn't have a... No, Sri, Ram Ram Sri Ramakrishna lived at the Kali temple at Dakshineshwar and he had his room, which is the, the, by then he was living in the room in which he's still living, uh, in which he lived to the end of his life, where we can also visit that room if we go there. Okay. And... Uh, uh, Holy Mother spent the first of uh, spent about six months living in that room with him, sleeping at his side. Uh, there were two cots side by side, and so she stayed with him. And then he would go into ecstasy in the night, oftentimes, and uh, he would become unconscious of the external world, and it would frighten her. Mm -hmm. And so he taught her how to uh, bring his mind down when that would happen, bring his mind back down to the worldly plane by chanting a certain holy name in his ear but uh, it's still she didn't get she got hardly any sleep because she was constantly afraid that he would enter into ecstasy and she would have to come and bring, you know so after that she, her quarters were moved to the concert tower there's a small concert tower uh, just what is it 100 yards maybe 75 yards from Sri Ramakrishna's room where Sri Ramakrishna's mother also stayed. His mother stayed in the upstairs room and the Holy Mother was given the downstairs room. It's a tiny little room. Literally, if I lay down in it, I couldn't stretch out fully. I would touch both sides. And she had all the supplies in there. And just outside, there was a little veranda on that room and then covered with bamboo matting. And there she would do her cooking. And she was so shy. She, was, uh, she would, after sunrise, she wouldn't come out. Oftentimes she wouldn't come out when there are people around, so she might be in there all day and all night. Was that the the Nahabat? Right? Nahabat, right? Nahabat. And, and it had like a low ceiling or something too. Right. There was a low. Well, there was a low doorway, and uh, she, she said she, at first she would bump her head against it, and then she learned to duck her head as she went through. It became automatic. Wow. Right. So very austere. But so at that time also. She received the spiritual instructions from Sri Ramakrishna and did intense spiritual disciplines and intense meditative practices. And uh, one of the things she did a lot and which she also used to tell us to do a lot is the practice of japa. She was, she, ex she extolled this practice of repeating the name of God and we repeat it over and over and over again. Uh, and it seems like, sounds like something well, isn't that boring? Why do you have to keep repeating it? Uh, isn't once enough? Well, it would be enough if we could do it with full concentration and fully get immersed in it. But uh, since we can't do that, we repeat it again and again and again, and it transforms us. She would say, Japat Siddhi, Japat Siddhi. From Japa comes perfection. From Japa comes realization. Mm -hmm. So uh, she did a lot of Japa. 
In fact, she would relate that uh, it, at those days at Dakshineshwar, she would repeat the mantra a hundred thousand times a day. Wow. Which is, uh, they call it a lakh in, in Indian languages. A uh, hundred thousand. How could she do it? And there's two, there's, all, there's two possibilities. One is that she would, con she just kept repeating it all day, no matter what she was doing, when she was working, what she, if she was cooking, if she was uh, prepare, bathing, whatever she's doing. She spent quite a bit of time also cooking for Sri Ramakrishna. And he, his, her food suited his stomach very well. The food that was prepared at the Kali temple, it often gave him indigestion. He had a delicate constitution due to all his intense spiritual disciplines, his, his austerities, we can say. So uh, that, and also as one starts to attain a, a deeper levels of japa, it can become very fast without losing its full power and uh, pronunciation. If we, tr if we try to repeat our mantra too quickly, we don't really give it the full mind. We don't, we can't, we should be able to pronounce or hear within or feel within each syllable of the mantra. Uh, and if we're doing it too fast, they get jarbled and gumbled, garbled and jumbled together. Mm -hmm. So, um, but there comes a time when it can be repeated more quickly and that doesn't happen. That, mm -hmm. that each syllable is still distinctly heard within, repeated within. Mm. So, so that may be another way that she had, she was able to do a hundred thousand every day. Wow. That is like amazing. On top of all the cooking and work and, you know, taking care of him that she was doing right. that also. Right. When did, what was the time period like when the disciples started coming, Vivekananda and all them and that, what was the relationship was, with them? Oh, uh, that, of course, that was at the end of Sri Ram, towards the end of Sri Ramakrishna's life, 1880, they first first one came, I think Latu probably came in 1880, 1881, they, they were coming. Um, with many of them, she was veiled. With many of them, she didn't talk with them. There was just a handful with whom she was uh, uh, intimately discussing. And one of them is Latu, the future Swami of Bhutananda, who used to help her knead the dough. And another was um, the elder Gopal, there was a, a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna who was actually older than him. And mm -hmm. he was called the elder Gopal. He became Swami Advaitananda afterwards. He also had access to Holy Mother and I he helped her with the grocery shopping and things like that. So, but Swami Vivekananda didn't have that relationship with her, though she would prepare food for him. And of course they knew each other, but he wouldn't have seen her face probably. Oh, interesting. Interesting. She would wear, you know, she she would wear her her veil and she'd put it over her head, and then let it hang down like that, so she can see out, but you she, you couldn't see her face. Aww. That was that was the tradition. That was in uh, Calcutta, in her. Uh, it, it, but the it, fascinating thing about the that tradition, and probably some of the the uh, Bengali ladies could tell us more about it, but. Um, when you go to your in-laws house, the woman would, the bride would go to her, her husband's home. Uh, she would be the daughter-in-law. So she is coming from outside. She's very humble, very meek. She always covers herself with a veil. But when she goes back home to her own place, to her mother's place and father's place, then she doesn't wear a veil. She, she is unveiled. So that's one reason why devotees particularly love to go see mother at Jairambati afterwards, her native place, because there yeah. she didn't wear the veil. She wasn't hidden from the men. With the women, she would she could remove the veil, but with the men, she wouldn't, in Calcutta, she wouldn't remove her veil. Oh, interesting. And she was going to Jairambati quite a bit, right? Just right. to take care of her parents and all that. Back and, it was a lot of going back and forth. Uh, you can, we can, I mean, if you, you can open the book and see in the, in the, the index, they'll have some list of dates of when she came and went. And I, yeah, uh, I was going to show some of the pictures too, because this book is amazing by Swami Chaitananda. He does so much research all the time, you know, but um, so when did her parents 
pass away? When did they, and how did that affect her? You'll have to see the, you'll have to see the book. I don't, I don't know those. Here's the interesting picture of her that I haven't really read this before. Uh, yeah, there were a, a lot what of What she's things holding things. there, it looks like a fur or something. It's probably taken in a photo studio. Oh, the, the, yeah, the, the yeah, photo yeah. Photo studios, yes. I'd like to read a couple of little quotes. Oh, please uh, do. That I, said, that I looked up. Um, here's a, a quote from Sister Deva Mata, who is an American nun who went to visit uh, Calcutta and stayed uh, in Holy Mother's orbit. Mother was living in a new dwelling in Calcutta given by her devoted followers of Sri Ramakrishna. Means the building which Swami Saradananda built for her, the uh, mother's house, which also housed the Udbodhan, the, the a Bengali magazine uh, awakening uh, on Vedanta teachings. She occupied the upper floor with a few women disciples who were always with her. And this is interesting. She describes the shrine room. Across the front of the second story where she spent her days, there ran one large room. This was the meeting place of the household and her bedroom also. At one end was the shrine, but there was no need of a dividing line because there was none in the lives of those who sat in that upper chamber. Mm, that's beautiful, beautiful. A beautiful expression of ordinarily the shrine is a separate room and we won't, in the traditional Hindu custom, you take a bath before and put on fresh clothing before you enter. You will make sure that you, you don't think any uh, nasty thoughts while you're there. You should be thinking only peaceful thoughts. And, uh, you wouldn't eat in the sh shrine. You would eat out, out in your dining room. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet here, the shrine and their living room was the same because there was no dividing line in their lives between secular and spiritual. It's all spiritual. And that's a yeah. beautiful lesson for us how to live. It's all spiritual. So there, if we make a dividing line that, uh, well, during the week, I go to work, and that's my secular life. And um, in the evenings, I do a little prayer, and that's my spiritual life. And there's a divide. But I can't be spiritual at work. Uh, then we're living, we're not living an integrated life. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest lessons she taught us, too. Because she was so gentle with um, her, her followers, her, her disciples, her devotees. She was always so gentle and forgiving and flexible, you know, if they ever said, oh, I can't do that or, they, okay, just do what you can do. You know, she wasn't all strict, like you have to do 10,000 japas a day, you know. Though she could also be, when necessary, she could be very strict. If there, say, if there was a, a novice, say, who had transgressed the monastic code, there was, you know, it, with compassion, but, you know, within the hour, his bags are packed and he's out. There you go. <laughs> That's love from mom. That's really good. So the place you were talking about, is that the one like in Belmont where you, it's near the Ganga or that's a different no. place? This is the mother's house. This is, it was a building in Calcutta near the Ganges. Belmont is on the other side of the Ganga. Okay. Uh, and in Calcutta, you have to cross the river from Belarmat. And in the neighborhood called Bhagavatar, there are several centers of our order, with a, um, but in nearby areas. This is the mother's house. Okay. It was built by Swami Saradananda in order for, to, to house the mother. And he took out a loan to do it. He mm. thought it was so important that he actually took out a loan. And how did he repay that loan? by writing the book, Sri Ramakrishna, the Great Master. Oh, by writing that book, and uh, the, the, the proceeds from the sale of that book repaid the loan for building Mother's House. So what is the place um, at, at Bellarmont on the grounds, but it's like across the street or something. It's on the same side of the Ganges where she lived for a while. You have to go upstairs and then they have oh, that okay, top okay. of a place okay, where she okay, did okay. those ceremonies. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, at Bailar Mutt, uh, which is our main monastery in India, uh, there's, of course, on the grounds itself, there's a small temple 
uh, for Holy Mother. And that's where her body was cremated after she left the body in Mahasamadhi. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also the, the old monastery before the monks moved into the Belermut, they lived just south of that in a rented house. And that rented house is now called the Old Mutt or Old Monastery. And Holy Mother had also stayed in that same building, not at the same time, at a different time. Holy Mother had rented that building and lived in it. And so that's uh, one of the few rooms that you, that where Holy Mother lived that you can actually enter and sit and meditate there. Yeah, the, uh, the I love that. that. Yeah. And I remember like we went up the, we went up the steps and then there's a big like um, patio kind of area, open air area. And they said that she used to sit in the sun and dry her hair there. And she used to do the five fires rituals there. And it oh, that, just- Yeah, that, that was the five fire ritual. That wasn't uh, uh, something ongoing. It was something that she did uh, once for uh, uh uh was it five or seven days in a row and then that was it it was just that one time that she okay did. but i just i like being on that ground where she actually was was so powerful and then inside it's just a small shrine room but it's so beautiful and sweet just really sweet and there's all those stories about you know what the things that went on in that room too um that I was amazed that we could actually go in and meditate and there was a Swamis there kind of leading us and it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so tell us a little bit about this niece <laughs> that she had that she kind of took under her wing because the daughter, her sister-in-law was such, no. yeah. So um, actually after Sri Ramakrishna left the body, Holy Mother found it extremely difficult to stay in this world. And she was continually plunged in meditation. And she was, seems like she was just waiting to give up the body. Right after he died, he left the, we should say left the body, really, not even use the term died. Uh, because what happened, she was weeping and weeping and weeping. And Sri Ramakrishna appeared to her and said, why are you weeping so much? I've just gone from one room to the other. So she had the direct vision of Sri Ramakrishna after he left the body. And so did some of the other disciples. Uh, and I think that that relationship between them continued throughout her life. She could, she received direct guidance from him at times and was in constant uh, communication with him. Sri Ramakrishna was the living presence for her. The, yes, he had been her husband, but he was also her God. And uh, he looked, she looked on him as a manifestation of the divine. And so she would carry his photograph with her wherever she went and she would make an altar with him installed on, on the altar and worship him daily, offering food, just as she used to do. And ordin our Hindu rituals can be quite complex with lots of mudras, as you know, where you put your fingers in little contortions and then lots of mantras and all of that. Those weren't part of her worship. It was very simple. He, she would say, come, time, time for your meal. And then she would serve him the meal. And then she would see him take it. She would, sometimes she would see a light come from the photograph from Sri Ramakrishna's eyes and touch the items. Or she would uh, feel his, his acceptance of the, of the items. Or possibly even she would see him come down and eat them. So we don't know, we don't know. She wouldn't let on too much of those inner experiences. So the the point of having the, her sister-in-law who was, I mean, oh, right. literally mentally insane something, right? She, lo she lost her brother, her her young brother, the, the youngest brother, the one who was actually spiritually minded and with whom she was closest. He died, leaving behind a newborn daughter and his wife, who became mad after the loss of his, uh, her husband, she lost her mental stability and became really crazy. And she couldn't look after the girl. And Sri Ramakrishna instructed her, take hold of this girl. 
She is Mahamaya. Take hold of her to live in this world. So Holy Mother became very, started raising this little girl, Radhu, as her own daughter. And Alex also became very attached to her. And it was kind of amazing for people to see Holy Mother, who's the, such a, the, the spirit, the, the guru, the, the divine mother. And yet she's so attached to this girl. That's not, that's, it seems like some kind of paradox or uh, strange. And on rare occasions, she let on the, yes, if I let go, I can let go of Radhu in a moment but then I, I can't be here. I don't have anything to hold on to here. So she held on to Radha specifically to be here in this world to minister to us and uh, guide us and bless us. Yeah, and Radha really challenged her at times too. <laughs> she also became mentally unstable. Yeah, and, and very, uh, she, she, at a certain point, she even became addicted to opium. Oh, wow. Yeah. But it kept Holy Mother here because she felt that Radu needed her, right? So that's what kept her in the body, kept her from leaving us because we really needed her too. I mean, Holy Mother never had officially birthed children of her own, but we were all her children. And all her children. She, Radu, fact, once she asked Sri Ramakrishna, you know, do you know that one? She asked him, well, will I not have any children? And he told her, in the future, you will have so many children, you will get tired of hearing the word ma, ma, <laughs> mother, mother. And so it happened. <laughs> yeah, so she was everybody's mother. And, and that motherhood, uh, Sri Ramakrishna knew that she would have to start manifesting it, and she did. And we should touch on that. This was a, when she first came to Dakshineshwar. It's a profound... Uh, ritual which Sri, Sri Ramakrishna undertook. Uh, there was a special night of the worship of the Divine Mother when the worship of the Divine Mother is to be performed in the Kali temple all night long. And um, he made arrangements in his own room to do a separate worship service. And there was a special little platform made for the deity to be seated there. And he had the flowers uh, collected and offerings and new sari and all the things that you need for a full puja. And uh, then he invited Holy Mother to attend the worship. And no one else was in the room. Everybody else was busy then in the Kali temple and he locked the door. And then what did he do? He asked Holy Mother to take the seat on the, on the altar that was made. So she took the seat of the deity and he worshiped her as the divine mother of the universe. Shorashi, the young girl, the divine mother in the form of a young girl, 16 years old. And everything, including dressing her in a new sari and feeding her. And the worship culminated in both of them entering into mystic union. Uh, we call it samadhi. And uh, being lost in samadhi for some time. Then at, at the very end of the service, Sri Ramakrishna offered the fruits of all his spiritual disciplines at her feet and uh, symbolizing it by taking his uh, mala, his java mala, his, the beads that he would use to count the mantra to, while doing uh, japa, he laid that also at her feet. Wow. So mother had that mala for the rest of her life. And uh, that was the, we can see that that was maybe the turning point of the awakening of uh, divinity in the mother that she started becoming aware of her uh, true nature as divine mother. And, yeah, and when uh, we look back at the stories, it seems like he he knew what was going to happen and he planned the whole thing, right? Like he orchestrated it. So it was kind of a seamless transition when he left the body that things still carried on. She continued. She really was the mother of the, uh, of the movement uh, until she, as long as she was alive. Even before that, Sri Ramakrishna was very strict with his disciples, you know, and uh, he, was to, he wanted them to me meditate all night. So if you're going to meditate all night, you shouldn't eat much for supper because that'll make your stomach heavy and you'll fall asleep. And so he would ask his young disciples, how many chapatis have you had? How many of those flatbreads have you had? And uh, it, it, apparently uh, they were allowed only one or two or at most three. But when they came to Holy Mother to be fed, she would give them what they wanted. 
So she would give them four or five. And so he asked his disciples in the morning, well, how many chapatis did you have last night? Oh, I had five. What? And uh, how many you, you had? Oh, I had four. What? So he, he called Holy Mother. And he said, you're spoiling their spiritual life by feeding them too much. Don't do that. You would think she was so humble and meek that she would say, I'm sorry, Master, I won't do that again. No. She said, I'm their mother. They will eat. I will feed them. I will see about their spiritual life. You don't have to worry about it. That's, what <laughs> <you said. laughs> That's so sweet. That's so, so sweet. We also feel like mother is looking after our spiritual life. She takes care of us, man. She really does. I tell the story about the cat. Do you remember when somebody was like hitting a cat with their foot or something and she scolded them? She says, no, no, you, you be kind to that cat. I am in that cat. I am also in the cat. There was a monk who, uh, there was a cat that was a little troublesome and uh, one of the monks actually would, would uh, sometimes beat it to give it a whack and get it to go away. And uh, mother couldn't bear to see any kind of cruelty like that. So, uh, but she, 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 exactly, she told him, I dwell also in the cat. So then, uh, of course, the monk couldn't, couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mother is in the cat yeah, also. Quickly. Yes, yes. So tell us what else can we, what are the main takeaways we can learn from her, from her life? Well, let's, I mean, if you look at how she lived her life, she lived her life simply uh, with one, uh, uh, around one focus, one uh, pivot around which the whole life moved, and that was Sri Ramakrishna. And everything revolved around him. And the whole day, every day revolved around spiritual life in the morning, meditation and prayer early in the morning but then all the duties she was cooking she was cleaning she was uh, ministering and she also did daily worship service everything though revolving around that still point of Sri Ramakrishna the divine re revolving around the divine that is the greatest lesson we find everything comes back to God always everything circling around God. Yeah, having that and, priority. And how she, how she made all her own, how people everywhere felt her to be their own mother. How did she do that? She went to South India. She couldn't speak any of the local South Indian language and the people there couldn't speak Bengali or, and of course they, she didn't know English so they couldn't communicate in English. Uh, but they came to her and felt that she was their own and she instructed them and initiated them and they understood her because it was a language heart to heart. Mm -hmm. Her final message, you know, her final message uh, to her, which she gave final spiritual message. If you want peace of mind, don't find fault with others. We love to find fault with others. And finding fault with others is also a way of uh, praising ourselves, you know, because when we find fault with someone, we're also saying, I don't have that flaw. Mm -hmm. I don't have that defect. Mm -hmm. If I have a certain defect, I'm not going to criticize it in someone else. If, uh, you, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, yeah, it's also saying basically, you know, appreciate each other. You know, right. So she, she said, if you're going to find, if you have to find faults, find, see your own faults. And then the next, uh, the, the corollary to that was um, the whole world is your own. Learn to see the whole, learn to make the whole world your own. Mm -hmm. And that's such, that's really the ideal of Vedanta to see the whole world as your own. In such simple language, she expressed the most profound truths. Uh, the whole world is our own. Where can we go where God is not? And without God, where, can, where would a home be? Home is where God is. So if God is everywhere, so we can be home everywhere. And every person is a manifestation of God. So every person is our own. Can we feel that the 
person uh, that we meet on our walk in the morning is our own brother or our own sister? Can we feel that the dentist who's about to drill into our tooth is our own brother or our own sister? Can we feel that the uh, guy begging for change on the street, a homeless man begging for change on the street is our own brother? He is. Can we feel that the uh, ornery customer in line at the grocery store behind us is our own brother, our own sister? Mm -hmm. She is. Mm -hmm. So this was mother's approach to see all as her own. And when we can do that, other people also respond to that. And they also begin to feel, I, I am accepted here. I am respected here. I am loved here. I mean, even just that is such a spiritual practice, you know, if we keep that in our mind always, it's a tough one, but <laughs> it's a, it's an amazing practice. So let's talk about when she got older and how she suffered from pain and all that. How did she handle all that? Uh, well, she also had, we all have to face physical difficulties as we get older, as we age, and Holy Mother was no exception. And she, some of her disciples or attendants would come and rub oil on her leg for her rheumatism. It made it hard for her to walk. Uh, but, you know, she, she, it was just a part, we wouldn't find her complaining about that. She was always concerned for others. She wouldn't be complaining about it, but... Yes, with the close disciples, she would allow them to rub some medicated oil and try to help the rheumatism. Uh, yes. <laughs> and I know there were, there were times when she was like such an empath that she would take on, um, she would take on other people's pain and other people's sorrows and um, other people's like karma and stuff too, right? That she would say if some if someone touched her feet that it made her feel the burning sensation. So sometimes the right. Well, that's we hope that we wouldn't be that those people. You yeah. know, people who who were what well, we say worldly, maybe not that spiritual. Obviously, they had some spiritual inclinations because they came to mother, but maybe they had done a lot of uh, uh, unwholesome acts in their life. And the, when they would touch her feet, it would feel a, she would feel a burning sensation, which is uh, she would try to wash the feet to re get rid of it, and she she couldn't. And yet there are other people, and we hope that we would be those people. When we when they would touch her feet, she would feel a she would say there's a cooling sensation. Very cool. so, a pure-hearted people would come to her for who are genuinely deeply spiritual people already. She would be so happy, and yet. The, this is the remarkable thing. Though her feet would burn when these kinds of people would touch her feet, still, she wouldn't turn them away. She would still initiate people in spiritual life if they, if they begged for it, if they really wanted it. There is an instance of uh, when she wasn't well in Jairambati and a group of people came from a distant place and they were not the most wholesome charactered people. And they were begging her for initiation. And she said, no, and she said, no, and she said, no. And they began to weep. And they were staying for a few days and they finally began to weep and begged her. And the floodgates of her compassion opened and she agreed. And nobody else, there was a, a, another instance of uh, some people who came to Belarmut to Swami Brahmananda for initiation. And he said, he can't, he can't. Because these great souls, when they initiate, uh, they really do accept the burden of the past actions of that person. They, they, and they can fall ill if the person is a, is a wicked person or, or has a lot of heavy karma. So Swami Brahmananda knew he could not initiate these people and keep his body. It would be too much. So. He sent them to Jayambati. Wow. And on their way, when they were on the way, coming close, Holy Mother was saying, most sons give good things to their mothers. Most sons give, give uh, pleasing things to their mothers and see what this, what Rakhal has sent. 
So she knew what was coming, and yet she initiated them. And when the monks at Belermat heard this, they were just amazed and could only say, grace, grace, she takes the poison and saves us. Mm -hmm. So that's um, her power, her spiritual power was such. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Um, so some of the, it, sometimes you have to read the first person accounts to really get a sense of uh, her compassion and forbearance when you read these. And my favorite, let, I should share with you my favorite book. Uh, it's called The Mother As I Saw Her. But let me just show you by Swami Saraveshananda. Um, There's so many good ones. Thank goodness we have these resources. It's going to show you guys a picture. Uh, well, I, I misplaced it somewhere. Uh, Here's a picture of when she was at Ud Udbodon House. That's that house I was talking about at um, Bellarmat in 1913 when she's meditating. It's like so beautiful. So 1913 that she was about, I don't know how old she was. But yeah. There's certain pictures of her that are really, you know, famous. She had an interesting relationship with um, Sister Nevada too. Yes, she looked on her as, as a daughter and uh, would call her Cookie, mean baby, baby. And uh, uh, Sister Nevada had given her a shawl. I, and uh, years later, after Sister Nevada had left the body, and some of the one of the young monks was uh, her attendants was cleaning her things and helping her pack and found this old moth eaten shawl and said mother why are you keeping this i'm throwing it out and she said no no that was given by nivedita when i see it i remember her please don't throw it out so she kept that as a memento assistant yeah they had a really special relationship and at first they had a hard time communicating right because of the language barrier but she felt the presence you know she felt the specialness in the beta 10. i don't know if that i, I can't imagine that i mean the difficulty in one sense but there's never a difficulty with mother in that sense but right. uh, she, sister nivedita relates how her ignorance of certain Indian customs actually enabled her to get these incredible blessings because for a European person to live in Holy Mother's own household was very difficult. And the, the kind of social problems that could create for mother and her family members back in the village at Jairambati, she was entirely unconscious of how difficult that could be. So she insisted. I'm, she, she had also a fiery nature. She was Swamiji's disciple and uh, she had Swamiji behind her. So she insisted, no, she wants to stay in mother's house. And so she kind of pushed it through and mother also agreed. So for some time she stayed in mother's own house. Wow. And uh, got that, that incredible blessing. And, well, and Holy Mother was also an advocate for women and women in the, as Manasseh, they started the, the, they named the um, convent after her, right? For the so women, the women monastic. The monastic order is called Sharada Mat, the, the Sharada Monastery. And uh, yes, she advocated for women to learn to read. Women couldn't read in, in those days. Of women, what, what, why do they need to read? They should, they are, their job is to bear children and cook and all those things. And well, what is the need to learn to read? So no, she herself learned to read. And she could read, she couldn't write much, but uh, she could read and she did read. And uh, th there was the instance of um, Radhu going to school and learning to read. And one of the other women saying, she's grown up now, why, does she, why should she go to school? And mother saying, no, she can continue to go to school. If she learns things, she can help other people also. She can help other people to learn to read and all of that. And she was a defender of, there was a, 
uh, kind of a colony of uh, people living probably in a little shanties just across the street from Udbodan and just po very poor laborers probably looked uh, somewhat squalid and there was a man there who started beating his wife or at least beating the woman who lived with him because the food wasn't prepared in time or something and so it was horrible and holy mother who was always so quiet and you you couldn't hardly hear her speak she would speak so quietly she came to the window and shouted out something like so you're going to kill her then and everyone was shocked by her powerful voice and he stopped what he was doing. And afterwards, uh, it seems they made up. Mm -hmm. So she was a defender of women's rights also, long before uh, that was uh, common. Yeah. Say. So after um, she left the body, how did, I mean, it was must have been so devastating for everyone. How did they carry on? <laughs> You know, it is said uh, 20 years after Swami Vivekananda left the body, someone remarked that they could still feel, a newcomer said they could still feel the grief of losing Swami Vivekananda the, 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 there yeah. at the monastery. So, but he died I, before Sharda Devi did. Uh, yeah, long back. He died in 1902. She left the body in 1920, 2021, 20, 21, I think. Um, uh, it's true that uh, all of us have to face that. Uh, we lose those we love and then we ourselves go and our teachers generally our teachers are older than us so some of us are still fortunate to have our gurus in the body others are our teachers have left the body already and true that's that's something yeah. to bear but it's an eternal relation yeah. and it, we have to come back again and again to that that our true nature is eternal and yeah. Uh, we don't die. We simply leave the body. Yeah. And she was just 67, but I guess it, in those days, that was an old was age old. to live to. Yeah. That was old. Yeah. yeah. She, she uh, I also wanted to mention uh, her careful attention to little things, her, what we would call now mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Now we call it mindfulness. There was somebody sweeping in the courtyard and after they finished sweeping they threw the broom aside it's not no, no longer necessary mm -hmm. she scolded the person the, the everything uh is has its value even the broom is has its special role to play and you should treat it with respect and it doesn't take any longer to put it away carefully as it does to throw it so you do it and you'll need it again and uh, it's also a part of this family, in a sense. So you should give it the regard, it's, it, it, it's due regard. Another incident, somebody had sent some fruits in a nice basket to be offered to in the shrine. And so the fruits were offered and um, distributed. And then what did the monks do? They took the basket and they threw it out in the lane. So trash, it's no longer necessary. And that was the system, you throw it out in the street and there are people who come and sweep the streets and clean it all and, or someone will find it. But the well, Holy Mother knows that said, see, they, those monks have thrown out that basket. They don't, uh, uh, they're not attached to anything. So they just threw it out, but uh, we can't do that. That's wasteful. We can use that basket. So she sent someone to go out and collect it and clean it off and save it for future use. Good so for her. That was her practicality and also her um, mindfulness. Yeah. Doing things mindfully. Yeah. And so simple and beautiful. Wasn't there a time like early on in their relationship when Ramakrishna gave her some bangles or something? Yes, he had bangles specially made for her. Uh, recognizing that she is as a divine mother, she should be adorned with some jewelry. And it's traditional, of course, for a Hindu widow to remove all of her jewelry. So after Sri Ramakrishna died, um, she started removing the jewelry and he appeared to her and stopped her. I'm not dead. I've just gone to the next room. 
So she, so she faced a lot of criticism for that too, because her whole life she wore the, the jewelry that a window, widow was supposed to remove. Only when your husband is alive do you keep your jewelry. Mm -hmm. And yet she kept her jewelry, at least those, those bangles, mm -hmm. even amidst that criticism because she understood that her husband is eternally living. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, I had that one photo of her where you can see, well, almost in all the photos, you can see her bangles on this. You can kind of see in her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, be they're beautiful bangles. She had a heavier ones. And then when she got very old, I, there are some lighter ones were made for her that weren't quite so heavy. But um, oh, nice. So anything else you want to add before we wrap it up? How about you? How about anybody else have any comments or reminiscences? Um, I have a small question. So you explained about the straw, the whole story of the straw, but why a straw? Like, what does the straw symbolize? And are we talking about like, I don't know, like what kind of straw? Are we talking about like grass straws or yeah. like? I mean, I, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, uh, well, straw farmers, they have, uh, you know, you, you might tie a string, but in the India of those days, even a string was a very precious commodity. So you wouldn't use that to tie on the twig. So you take a, a uh, just, you know, a, a, a dried blade of grass, basically. A straw means a dried blade of grass, not the kind of straw. Yeah, I was like, I don't think they developed that <laughs> much. <laughs> so I was like, that doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. I also wanted to ask, you also mentioned or you stated like, if you want peace of mind, you shouldn't notice the flaws of others. So what's your advice on, cause that's a very hard concept to apply in real life, especially in your professional life when, you know, or just in life, when we're not here, we go back to our lives and you know, when someone's done you wrong, but then you're like, mm. like how, how do you like mentally shift your gears there? Mm -hmm. Great question. When uh, and when we see Holy Mother, she would say, "Don't find fault." Uh, however, that doesn't mean that she couldn't see flaws. Sometimes, she, if she, in her disciples, she might see some character flaw and try to correct it for their own help, for for their betterment. Uh, but the attitude of always criticizing, which is so common in our world, that and. So watch, if you watch your mind, if we watch our minds, we'll find that at various times during the day, we'll immediately say, oh, he didn't do that well. Oh, she did that wrong. Oh, what an idiot. Look what they did. In dr driving, for instance, how many, how many of us will, will call other drivers idiots in the course of our journey? Uh, why? Be <laughs> that, that's not going to bring us peace. So uh, to just give it up, it's actually a practice to just say, all right, today I won't find fault with others. We try it for a day. Today I won't find fault. All right, somebody uh, does us wrong at work. Well, that brings up another issue of forgiveness. And uh, that's, a, that's a big topic. Holy Mother was really the embodiment of the, that kind of forbearance and forgiveness. And where we, th we would think that someone deserved a th sound beating or at least a, a strong disciplining. And she would be concerned that that person's feelings wouldn't get hurt. So wh wh where is the line between um, forgiveness and setting boundaries? That's uh, something we have to learn each for ourselves. On the one hand, forgiving does not mean becoming a doormat. It means relinquishing the ill feelings we have towards someone for their, for their ill behavior towards us. Uh, simply relinquishing the anger and the negative feelings. But it's, uh, will, it will be necessary to set boundaries. You may have to say, don't ever do that again. Or it may even be that we have to have to say uh, there there's not going to be any relations between us in future. I recognize that you are a manifestation of God, uh, but one that I will salute from a distance. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. One thing I do, if I find my mind going there, like feeling anger or frustration towards someone is I just stop and think, okay, be like mother. How would mother respond? You know? And I use her as my example of how, and then it kind of corrects my thinking. Cause I'm like, okay, well, she wouldn't do what I'm doing. So <laughs> shift you know but it, I think the cat is a good example because she didn't just say oh let that guy kick the cat you know he is he's not at fault she's like no you have to you have to do what's right you have to stick up for the cat you know so yeah she definitely wasn't a pushover <laughs> right it is a, it is a beautiful combination of on the one hand very great clarity and and standing up for what's right and on the other hand this incredible forbearance and forgiveness and not holding a grudge she would not be one to hold a grudge ever yeah and having that that um unconditional love like a mother for everyone like she wants the best for everyone yes. she wants them to you know feel good and she wants them to feel loved and that love was really flowed equally to her very close spiritual daughters and very close spiritual sons and those whom she didn't know, those who, who were considered outcast in society, those who were even perhaps engaged in criminal activities. Like the, there's the famous case of Amzad, who was a Muslim day laborer who, when times were tough, would also resort to burglary and uh, things like that to maintain his household. And she knew that. And yet she also loved Amzad. And when he came to her house, he would receive the same treatment of getting, uh, being served food and uh, love and attention and affection. Yeah, because she also knew that he loved her. And there's that prayer um, you sent me once, I love it, that the, the, the translated line says something like, if one calls upon you as mother, you take him into your arms. Mm -hmm. So all we have to do is call upon mother and recognize her as our mother. And she's there for us like that. Yes, yes. <laughs> so sweet okay well we're over time so um is, does anyone have any other questions before we go all good okay great all right thank you so much swamiji can you take us out with a chant let's see i was thinking we should do a line from this beautiful hymn that composed by swami abhedananda to holy mother it's a sanskrit hymn and uh he sang it for her also and she, she approved of it. She was pleased to hear it. So maybe this line. Om Pavitram Charitam Yasya Pavitram Jeevanam Tatha Pavitrata Svarupinyai Tasyai Kurumo Namo Namaha To her whose nature is sanctity, to her whose life is sanctity, to her who is the very embodiment of holiness, purity, and sanctity, to her we bow down again and again. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you, Parama. And Jai Ma, everyone. I'll, I'll let you know what time we're going to meet next month, but we've got um, Swami Satya Mayananda joining us. And his topic is going to be surrender, the highest spiritual point. That should be good. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, so I'll let you know what time. But thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.